Welcome to Through the Dark Woods podcast, a space for conversation around navigating grief, trauma, and soul work. My name is Josia Tamir Crossley. I'm a somatic therapist, grief worker, ritualist, and the founder of Through the Dark Woods, Real Life Skills for Navigating Grief and Trauma, which is an ongoing grief tending, skill building, and process based group, which helps participants find the heart in their common humanity while building resilience and increasing their capacity to be with the full, beautiful aliveness of being human. This is an ongoing group, and doors for registration open every three months. You can find out more at throughthedarkwoods.ca. Link is in the show notes. I acknowledge that this podcast is produced where I live and work in Kathet, the traditional territory of the Kliaman people. My own ancestors came across the ocean from the northern lands and islands of what we now know as Europe. I acknowledge that I'm still learning about reconciliation and how to live in a good way on this land, and that my intention and prayer is that this podcast and all my work may directly and indirectly support repair of the harm done through colonization of this land and its traditional people, as well as repairing the even older harm done by the colonization of the old world, as we might call it. May this work benefit all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free, free of suffering and the causes of suffering. And may we all recognize liberation together. So today I'm super excited to be joined by my very dear friend and colleague, Colleen Adrian. Colleen helps parents of sensitive, spirited kids learn connected parenting skills so they can build a strong, connected relationship with their children and leave behind authoritarian methods that break their bond. She's the author of Freeing Your Child from Self-Criticism and Perfectionism. She's a mother of a beautiful teenage young man, and she's also a stepmom. Colleen offers one-on-one coaching and online courses to help parents who are often sensitive themselves gain skills for helping their children and themselves find calm when anger or intense emotions arise, helping their children to be less hard on themselves and build confidence and self-esteem, and gaining skills to react less and stay calmer with their kids, and reconnecting with a child or teen who's rebelling or pushing them away. Her perspective is informed by her experience, of course, parenting as a mother, and also current research in neuroscience, psychology, spirituality, and the Eight Shields cultural repair model. You can find out more about her work at ColleenAdrian.com, and she has a five-week course which starts October 24th, 2022, and does run regularly, if you're listening to this podcast at a later date, called How to Help Your Child Calm and Regulate. Really recommend checking out her work. So welcome, Colleen. Thanks so much for having me, Josia. Yeah, great to see you. So we've known each other for a few years now, probably like mm-hmm. five or six years, I think. Hey, we've mm-hmm. been in connection. And yeah, and it's been so beautiful to watch your work develop alongside each other as, as my work is developing. And then we also both have these boys who you have an almost grown up young man now mm-hmm. and mine as well in his way at almost 15. And how old it? Ross is 18 now? He'll be, yeah, he'll be 19 he'll be in 19, November. So. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So I know that this, yeah, this parenting journey is very personal for you. It's experientially fed. <laughs> so we can talk about that. But the first thing I want to ask you is something that I ask everyone who comes on the show. And that is how was grief dealt with in your family of origin? Hmm. Thanks. So I think that occasionally there was space for it, but more often than not, it was skipped over kind of in a spiritual bypassing sense. So I grew up in a fairly religious home and there was always lots of reasons from a religious perspective why you could still be happy or positive about something. So Mm. You know, I wouldn't say that was always the case, but probably more than 50% of the time, for sure, probably at least 70 or 80% of the time. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so the spiritual override through the old religious way, right? Cause we see that yeah. in the new age movement a lot, but yeah, it's making me realize, oh yeah, that's not actually a new thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think it's new at all. And the fact that there is mm. a heaven somewhere that we'll all see each other when we die. And like, there's all sorts of narratives that yeah. support staying happy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just yeah. being okay with things and yeah, not facing mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the devastation or the emotional realm that might come with, you know, real grief. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of stepped into this journey of connected parenting? Where did that originate? You knowing you being such an expert in this, this body of work? Yeah. So I started when I was going to have my son, Mm. I started reading the books on parenting Mm. and I knew I wanted to do some things differently than I had been parented. And my parents, just to be really clear, loved me very much and were very dedicated, wonderful parents. And I was, I was born in the early sixties. You know, it was an age where behavior was front and center when you, in terms of what you focused on for parenting and emotional attunement wasn't really that talked about yet, if talked about at all. So I think I was parented pretty typically for that age, but I knew that I wanted to do things different. I definitely had some painful memories of different aspects of my childhood and especially my teen years where I was quite rebellious and quite disconnected from my parents. And yeah, I think those were major motivating factors for me wanting to do things differently. So when I started reading the parenting literature, when I was pregnant and in the early years of parenting, and I found the attachment parenting books, I was like, yeah, this is it. Like, I really want to do this. This is just, this resonates in my heart. This feels so right. Mm. And then I had my son and, you know, things probably went along fairly predictably in the early years, like in the infant years, you know, difficulties Mm -hmm. with sleep and so on. Certainly there was struggles, but it wasn't all that unexpected. And then, you know, in the toddler years and the preschool years, when they really start to develop their own sense of their self and their personality, getting cooperation was challenging. Uh That that will... (laughs) That, that will, will yeah. comes online. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put my shoes on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and their sense of self, their sense that they're a separate human being, right? Which is such a beautiful thing, but you still need cooperation sometimes because, you know, guess what? We have to go to maybe the doctor sometimes or wherever you have to show up. And yeah. 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 And like I always, I always say to people, you know, it's like we have to actually establish that no before we can have a real yes in our lives, you know, and that starts to establish at that age. Right. And yet how do you, yeah. So this is what I'm really curious about. How did it go for you? And then how have you found the ways to honor the child kind of establishing their will, but still, you know, (laughs) being able to get to the grocery store? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I love that you have to establish a no before you can establish a yes. It's that's really beautiful. So I think your question was, how do you go about doing that? Is that what you asked? Yeah, exactly. Like what happened for you next? You know, how did you stay with the attachment parenting or or what? Yeah, what happened? Well, I struggled with attachment parenting, to be honest. Like it was right. a, a long time till I really figured it out. And I'd read Gabor Mate and Gordon Neufeld's book, Hold On To Your Kids. And I loved it. My son was probably about three at that time. Hmm. I loved it. And I was like, yeah, I need to, you know, and he talks about connecting before directing. And like I said, you know, the connecting piece just wasn't really working very easily for me. I really struggled. And it was a few years, really, before I realized it probably wasn't until he was maybe around 12 or 13 that I discovered Irene Lyons' work and nervous system regulation. Mm. And I was like, okay, I'm not regulated enough myself to be able to help this kid calm down. Uh Uh-huh. Right. Okay. So the nervous system, the work, the somatic work and the nervous system. And for those of you who don't know Irene Lyon, a lot of you probably know her already because if you're following me, I shared her work a lot, Mm -hmm. but she has the smart body, smart mind course, which both Colleen and I have done great work. So that started to shift your awareness of what was happening between the two of you in in your relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally got why and how I needed to do things differently suddenly, you know, and so before that, really, you know, the challenges and, you know, I've been, I'll say muddling my way around along and I really, I mean, I did a lot of things differently that I'm really grateful for to the literature and so on. But in the times when the stuff that I wasn't reading in the book wasn't working, that was probably the problem most of the time. And yeah. Yeah. Some of the difficulties that I ran into, for instance, were things like setting limits, Mm. right? Not knowing where to set limits. And I I see that a lot 
in the conscious parenting circles as well, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the conscious parenting circles, if people are really embodied and really connected to their emotions, I think that they can use those conscious parenting principles without spiritual bypassing and without, yeah, because if you're connected to your disappointment, are, are you following me here? Or am I skipping too much? Yeah, no, it's great. You're talking about the, like the conscious parenting. I mean, what I've seen in just like other parents and friends that are raising small children sometimes is they're like, I'm conscious parenting, but then you don't see them setting any boundaries with their kids mm-hmm. and their kids are like, holy terrors. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, we don't want to be like that authoritarian shutting them down and, you know, yeah. but then, but then we also can't obviously let them become like the holy terrors. Well, right. So, well, we don't yeah. do right by them if we don't support yeah. them to learn to manage their own behavior and also yeah. support them to manage their behavior, at least well enough that most of the time there can be some sense of harmony in the household, as opposed to, you know, chaos or real intense eruptions. Right. Yeah. Well, cause otherwise you're kind of raising like a little narcissist that just thinks they like, be yeah, however they are. Exactly, and like nobody, exactly. nobody else matters. Right. So exactly. Yeah. But it's hard. And I think what parents tend to do, and Barbara Colorosa talked about this already in the nineties, but she didn't have the somatic lens. Yeah. So people tending to go from the really, you've been raised authoritarian, you've got some old wounds from that. So you tend to want to swing the other direction, Mm -hmm. you know, and be more permissive and honor who your child really is. And I think that's the piece about the conscious parenting that really needs to be preserved is that the recognition that we're a spirit residing in a human body, having a Mm -hmm. lifetime here on the earth plane. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you want to honor who your child really is authentically. Right. Mm-hmm. Like kids are people too. We don't want to just, right. like, treat them like they're not. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Or override or instill who we are on them. You know, right. I mean, we want to teach them some values, but we want to recognize their uniqueness as well and see them in their own wholeness somehow. And so how do you figure out what the difference between doing that and when to set limits and when you let them go because they're authentically expressing themselves? Right. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that was a struggle, like a philosophical struggle that I battled with really or engaged with and navigated until I discovered the somatic work. Yeah, beautiful. And and I mean, me too. And I feel like that's, it's something that I'm still often like contemplating with my now teenager, right? It's like, mm. okay, I want to set a limit. And, and maybe you can speak to this more because I just, what I'm thinking about is like, what I've noticed recently is that if I'm dysregulated, around Mm -hmm. when I'm trying to set a limit. If I'm like, you can't, you know, kind of going into that place, he just shuts down. He's like, I am not hearing what you're saying at all. There's no information coming in. (laughs) Like we are not, yeah, nothing. Whereas if I'm calm, anchored in myself, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a different level of communication that can happen then maybe. So can you just speak to that a little bit more? Like, or is that kind of what you're talking about? Like the, that, Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So in the teen years, that's what it looks like for sure. And the teen years, of course, you have to shift even a little bit more in terms of almost, you know, I talk in one of my webinars about asking more curious questions. It's almost like you can't even tell anymore. You know, in the early years, it's connect before you direct. You don't even direct really when they're 15, like they're probably not going to hear it. They're trying to sort them. They're trying to figure out who they are Mm. and they don't want to be told. So yeah, that's really relevant for the teen years. In the younger years, the setting limits, I think the biggest barrier for me, and I see this in a lot of parents as well, is not being connected to our own disappointment and grief, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so not feeling comfortable enough with it to allow your child to really feel the full intensity of their own grief and disappointment when you've set a limit. Mm. right? So the things that people do might be quickly trying to distract them from their disappointment. So and so can't come over for a play date anymore. He's sick. Oh, well, you know, and your child starts to cry. Well, you can see so-and-so instead, you know, quickly pick up the phone and, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, try to fix it or try to. So just that maybe lack of recognition and probably lack of comfort in yourself of that need to just grieve the disappointment and say, you know, you really wanted to see Alex and he can't come today, right? I see you, you're sad, right? And letting that run its course 
before mm-hmm. you kind of move on to, well, now, now that that's finished, gee, what could we do? Right? Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Cause I see that. I've seen that so much. And I mean, in myself occasionally, but Chogyam Trungpa, my favorite line of his is the fastest road to enlightenment is disappointment. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I just have like always held that in both in myself, but also in my parenting, you know, and sometimes I'll actually say that to Yarrow and then he's like, fuck off mom. Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah go enlighten yourself yeah, exactly. yeah? <laughs> but I think there's something really powerful that we deprive them of when we try to like pass o- over that right and rather than just sitting with it absolutely absolutely I think it's the beginning of where our grief can get stuck mm. and then I think that in a world that's really affluent I don't want to assume the socioeconomic state of our listeners, but by and large, with social programs, lots of us do have what we need and more. Mm -hmm. And so especially in affluent households where we don't have to say no to our kids very often, Mm. sometimes there just is less disappointment. Yeah. And I think less connection to feelings, less resilience, less a whole bunch of things as a result of that. But it starts, I think, with parents not recognizing. And to be fair to parents, what's ticking along in the background, and I know this was the case for me, is really still probably on some level, a need to heal your own wounds Mm -hmm. and not really knowing how to do that. So Mm -hmm. just kind of creating happiness where you're able Mm -hmm. without really realizing because Mm -hmm. you're not connected enough to your own feelings. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's interesting because I grew up in the opposite non-authoritarian, like what Barbara Coloroso would call, I think it's the jellyfish. The jellyfish, Where there's like no boundary because I was raised by a single mom. And so she just wasn't you know, I think, I think that's common in single parent households where it's just yeah. like the parent, you just don't have the bandwidth. As a single no, parent she's to, busy sur- yeah. getting enough to survive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's not necessarily as much watching what your kid's doing, making sure they're home for dinner, that kind of thing. So there's just kind of, yeah, the, yeah. the setup for it. But I think because I grew up that way, well, for one thing, I didn't know even like, I didn't even know what kind of limits would be like normal. <laughs> Mm, right. <laughs> and I've had to like learn that over time and establish it over time. And for another thing, I think I just have like wanted to give, sometimes we just want to give our kids like what we didn't have, right? And but we don't realize that yeah, that disappointment is still a really important and integral mm. piece in their journey, right? Of learning yeah. how to be with their feelings. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. And then what about, so you said something that really intrigued me um, earlier about like with teenagers, how you actually have to almost like step back from not as much telling them, you know, the correcting, but more like asking questions, being curious. And can Mm -hmm. you just say a bit more about that and how that works with, you know, if you're still wanting to set limits, but. Yeah. uh, So there's a range. I have a son who's sensitive and spirited and has always I mean if he's going to do something he's going to do it so when he hit that sort of age around 15 where he really needed to step out I mean I knew that there were times when he wasn't really asking about doing something he was I knew he was going to do it anyways he might have kind of asked because it was the habit but I knew he was going to do it anyways and so you really need to shift if you're going to stay connected you really need to shift to yeah asking the curious questions with the tone and making the assumption that they might have already thought it through Mm -hmm. and they might not have but you want to kind of give them the benefit of a doubt because it's the respectful thing to do right right so not kind of a condescending well did you think about (laughs) <laughs> exactly. But more exactly. of a real it's true a, curiosity. It, exactly. So, you know, you're going to do such and such. Okay. So I'm assuming maybe you've made a plan for that. And I'm wondering how you're going to manage this piece. And I'm wondering how you're going to manage that piece. And let's just walk it through. Mm. Right. Mm. And then oftentimes they 
haven't thought about any of those pieces. And then they start thinking about it, or they might have thought of one or two, but that's that that's you leaning in as their parent and kind of lending them your prefrontal cortex. Right. So they can learn, right? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. And say a little bit for our listeners who may not understand what's happening with the teenage brain and the prefrontal cortex at that age. Yeah. Right. So they just, very generally, they just really are rewiring. Like everything I've read about the teenage brain is that it's almost like connections that were there previously start to come apart and then it's it rewires itself. And so really that prefrontal cortex piece and the ability to plan and organize even if they had some of those skills before, those often disappear for a bit and then they resurface, which is why you really, you want to walk through those things with them and you want to stay connected to them that they'll enough that they'll let you mm. walk through those things. And if I could say one other thing about a critical strategy to use at that age is to use a neutral tone of voice. And that's where we come, where, where being regulated comes in as well, because they just pick up so quickly. Right. If you're not approving or if you're irritated or if your expectations are higher than they're able to manage or what have you. Right. right. And especially for these sensitive kids, which a lot oh, of, yeah. a lot of teens are these days, right? Just really yeah. hyper attuned. And so they'll pick up. I know with my son for sure, he picks up like immediately. He'll be like, Is there something going on? Mom? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes before you even open your mouth, they know they can just feel it. Yeah. And beautiful so that... that you've created a safe enough space <laughs> yeah. that he'll ask. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's like, Fuck off. <laughs> don't get it. You know, don't ask yeah. me. Because it's like, we don't always, we also don't always. And I think it's also not always appropriate to share with them what's going on if there is something that we're holding that's stressful, right? You know, it's like- Oh, if it's just to do with, yeah. Oh, if yeah. it's to do with, yeah, not them. But mm-hmm. you can share that there's it's stressful, of course, and that their radar is accurate. Is accurate, right. And that they, that, that you've yeah. got it. I've got this. Right, yeah. Right? So right. that they can feel that sense of safety. Uh-huh. I've got uh-huh. this. Uh-huh, beautiful. So accurate reflection and then letting them know, you know, that you've got it. Yeah. Even even if you feel like you might not have it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, let, let or them know I, that or they're... I'm or you're right, I'm struggling with it a bit and I have enough support. I have enough and support. I'm, and I'm confident that I'm gonna mm. sort it out because I know I have enough support mm. from mm. my people around me in the community and or my partner or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's so powerful for them to know that that you have we have enough support and that they don't need to feel like they need to play that role. Caretaker. Our, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that I just had the image of when you're talking about it, like a, a butterfly or like a, ca- a caterpillar, you know, when they go through that metamorphosis stage and they just like turn to like mush for a period of time. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of like what's happening in the teenage brain at, yeah. at, at certain periods. Right. Like, it, and is that kind of when they're hitting puberty or is it a bit before or a bit after, or, or is it? I think I would, I think it really starts when they're hitting puberty, kind of the the hormones are a part of it. Yeah. And people say that prefrontal cortex piece, like, isn't totally sorted out until, you know, 25 or close to it. Like it's a long time. Yeah. Which is so amazing that our brain, yeah, takes that long to really fully establish itself. And then of course it's still plastic at that age at 20 after 25 too. Right. But, but there's a sort of a structure that's that yeah to yeah some it's it's yeah. so plastic and it's nice to know that there's that much plasticity during that time period too because you don't have to worry so much mm-hmm. if their performance is less than because there's just there's opportunity for them to learn and staying connected is just it's so important because then when they do run into trouble they'll come to you uh-huh. Uh-huh. yeah yeah beautiful yeah and isn't that what we want you know because i think yeah. I think some of the greatest tragedies happen when teens don't feel like they have somewhere safe to come to. And so they try to sort it out on their own or with their amongst their peers. And then yeah, it's like, they just don't have the capacity for that. Right. So, yeah. They don't. Yeah. And their peers, however well-intentioned they might be, don't have the perspective or the, or the capacity either. Right. No, so, they don't. Yeah. No. So you want them to come to you. So it's yeah. Yeah. And one thing that I, I've heard as well, 
maybe you can verify this, is that basically the attachment brain in those teenage years, it's like almost growing as much as it is when we're really little, when we're in those early, like two, three, four kind of years. And so we actually have an opportunity to anything that we messed up in those younger years, we kind of have like the opportunity to resolve or repair in that those teenage years in terms of attachment and connection. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I haven't heard that before. I'm just thinking it through here as we speak. Yeah, it's probably it probably is pretty individual, but I think because right. of the plasticity, I think there's probably lots of opportunity there. And yeah, I always say like our kids always want to be connected. Like nobody really wants to be floundering mm-hmm. on their own when they're that age. So mm-hmm. even if they're pushing you away, I know that ultimately they want to be connected and I think it's typical especially for a, a rebellious or and or a spirited teen to maybe go in and out of connection, like maybe they'll get mad at you for a day or two, and then, you know, you'll, you'll repair or whatever, if you've set a limit, but I don't think it's the normal, you know, people talk about rebellion, I don't think it's the norm to just be disconnected, you know, Mm -hmm. for long periods of time with no reconnection. And I think it's always possible to reconnect if you just keep doing connecting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you say connecting things, can you say a bit more about, yeah. So like what kinds of like just really practical, I mean, we talked, you talked about the, just being genuinely curious with our teens. Yeah. yeah. What other kinds of connective things can we do? The other one that I mentioned that's really important is the neutral tone, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. not judging them. And then if you're really intent on keeping them safe, you know, another thing I could say about that is, really talking to them about safety. So the example I gave earlier, where you're going to walk through, like, what are you going to do about this? Or for instance, maybe you're concerned, maybe your child is 14 and you know, they're wanting to experiment with drinking alcohol and you're worried about that, right? It's a risky behavior. They're young. Maybe you're not sure about somebody they're hanging around with, not judging their friends and then teaching them safety things. I did this with my son. I was like, these are the things we know that are risky about drinking alcohol. And Mm. these are the things that you could do to keep yourself safer, eat something ahead of time, Mm. be with somebody who isn't drinking maybe, or maybe only has one so that you can take care of each other. Mm. If you haven't tried it before, try one drink, know that we had just been watching what's that Netflix thing, Stranger Things. I don't know if you've seen that or not. (laughs) And near the end in a couple of, in some of the episodes, they're drinking quite a bit. Okay. And I just, you know, I said that tendency to kind of behave in a, because you've had too much to drink, like to behave out of control. When you're doing that, you don't realize it. You don't realize till the next day. Right. <laughs> so we're yeah. to the wise and it's because your judgment is impaired. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So try one drink and then see how it goes. Wake up the next day. See if you think it went okay. Uh, don't just drink a whole bunch and think that it's not a big deal because you're so those kinds yeah. of safety things and telling them stuff like that really does help keep them safe. And it mm. also helps build the trust in your relationship because they can see that. And you've still told them, I would prefer you don't at this age. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about your kid that, you know, is going to go out and do it anyway at some point. Right. right? Yeah. So you're not condoning it, but you're giving them the information to make good decisions when you know that they're going to sneak at some point, you Mm -hmm. know, within the next three to six months anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So you, you are setting the kind of, you're setting a guideline around what you feel you're making that clear around, around what you think the guideline is, but you're also giving them information and even like some psychoeducation around like, yeah, Yeah. your brain, it's going to seem like it's fine or normal (laughs) what you're doing when you're high or drunk or whatever, but, but it actually, that's because of the effect that it has on your brain. So you're giving them that education. That's powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think the most important piece is that you're really affirming that even though this isn't what I want as your mom, you're building a trusting relationship because you're helping them see that your safety really is your bottom line. You're not mm-hmm. just trying to control them. That's yeah. what I'm trying to get across. Right. This isn't just about control. This is about safety. And here's right. what I need you to know. 
Right. Because I want yeah. you to be well. I would be devastated if something happened to you. Right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And because, like, what do you think the different, like, the difference in the reaction would be? Or have you seen this even in your own child when you come more with controlling? No, you absolutely cannot do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just the total shutdown. Total shutdown. You're telling them what to do and you've got that. And usually there's some anxiety too underneath it, right? Right. So again, so that's where the nervous system regulation mm. piece comes in. I mean, the work that I have done to be able to do that, sometimes with my son, I'm not going to pretend I haven't slipped and, you know, <laughs> Oh yeah. Try to stop them from doing things when I was yeah. having a panic no. attack yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Hanging onto their leg as they're going out the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for the most part, my panic attacks happened in the middle of the night mm. as I was processing my own anxiety with the help of doing somatic work on a regular basis. And then I was bringing my grounded, calm self to the relationship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And so how do you, cause you have a course upcoming where you're going to be teaching parents some of these skills, correct? Yeah. What kinds of things do you teach and how do you go about that? Yeah. So the course, I'm really excited about the new f- format, Josia, because, you know, one of the difficulties for the parents who have been taking my courses and for myself as the person who offers it has been mm-hmm. finding a time that people can attend because people work and they take their kids to skating and yada, yada. Yeah. We're busy when we're parenting. Oh yeah. So I have just finished recording all of the content so people can listen to the video or audio at their own pace or on their own timeline schedule each week. So it's a five week course. The content is spread out over five weeks and there'll be enrichment classes, two options of times every week for people to come and ask questions about the content and get help applying the new knowledge. And we cover a little bit of the nervous system regulation in the first week, just enough to really get a good grasp for what you need to know to make practical application, basically. Mm. And then in the second, and we talk about regulation and co-regulation. In the second week, we do work around how to regulate yourself as the parent. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, at some point we do talk about anger mm. and we talk about, yeah, I think it might be that week. Actually, we talk specifically about anger and then we get more the fourth week. We get more into the strategies. There's little bits of strategies at the beginning, but there's more content at the beginning. And then we get more into the strategies at the end. And then the okay. final fifth week is about really, what do I do when this doesn't work? So people have been trying stuff by that time. (laughs) And we can just really have some time in class to sit down and say, okay, why isn't this working for you? Or what is working? And so on. Yeah, Yeah, great. Yeah. And I think that's, that's amazing. Because it's like, I think so often we read things in books, or, you know, read things online or watch things online. But then when it actually comes to like, the rubber meets the road, and we're trying to apply it to have somebody to actually guide us along and bounce ideas off of and reflect is pretty invaluable, especially when it comes to something like parenting where every kid is a bit different too. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the outside eyes too. I find lots Mm. of times, even if people have the information, sometimes they just can't quite see where if they just tweak it and say something different right at this juncture or handle it differently right there it shifts the whole interaction. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 And do you, what kind of things do you see shift in the people that you've worked with? What have you noticed? So parents are typically, they're often surprised at how quickly changes happen Mm. because a lot of what I focus on is really making sure that you hear and see your child really well before you try to focus on anything related to behavior. And that's just so healing in itself. Mm. So depending on what the situation is like and what the parent child is relationship is like, sometimes I see changes sooner than others, but for sure parents are surprised at the different response they get when they approach their child differently and use different language. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. No, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm, even just on the, you know, with the nervous system regulation tools, like I, th- I think we just get so busy in our lives and especially if we're parenting and we're working and we're, you know, whatever else we have going on, it can be, can be challenging to actually like 
see our kids when they're in front of us. Cause sometimes if we're stressed and if we're busy, then all we see is what they're not doing or what, how yeah. they're adding to our stress level. Totally. Whereas I can imagine, you know, when people start to get more aware of their own nervous system and, and how that's impacting the relationship and can start to then show up with more presence. It's like yeah. kids are so what I always see in my practice. And I occasionally work with kids is that they're just so resilient. Like they like immediately respond to yeah. the changes that we make as parents, you know, because they're just, they're just like open nervous system, right. They're just like ready for healthy nervous system. I mean, and yeah, and so yeah, that's exactly it. And and that's the piece that I didn't mention. Thank you, Josia, is that piece about the parent being regulated too, is really part of what helps the kids shift, right? They can sense the safety, they can sense a safe space to co-regulate. They really respond yeah. to that. Yeah, beautiful. No, I've definitely witnessed that in my relationship with my son. Similar to you, I, <coughs> I got into the somatic work when he was really young and just got to kind of witness the shift in our relationship over time. And it's it's been profound, you know, the, mm. the difference that it makes to be regulated myself. And so I think it's just so beautiful that you're specifically offering these skills to parents, you know, because I think even if we have read a book and intellectually or cognitively understand that we want to do things differently, we still have that imprint of our parents that yeah. our parents gave us in our nervous system, right? We can't glean what they don't give us or what they don't have to give us. So, when, but when we, but we can start to rewire it ourselves, right? We rewire our nervous system, rewire how we respond to, mm -hmm. to our kids, to each other. And then that new imprint gets passed on too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's really exciting. Yeah. And when does this next course of yours begin? So the start date is October 24th. And it'll run for five weeks and end on November 24th. And the registration will open on October 10th. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And anything else that you want to say about that or just about anything that we've, we've talked about? We talked about setting limits earlier and how hard that can be if we don't recognize, you know, their need for grief. And mm. I, I just think I'd like to add that the reason the somatic work has really been helpful for me and that it's helpful for other parents is mm. because our answers and that knowing for when to set boundaries and limits is in our bodies mm. and we can't access it. So yeah, if it's kind of covered over by all our own dysregulation and our own trauma, then yeah. we can't, we can't necessarily access that innate yeah. wisdom in the body. That's like, that's a no, right? Like, yeah. 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 It's yeah. our, our, our messages from our body are muddled or we're mm -hmm. actually disconnected from them. Mm -hmm. So you might read in a book, well, you should set a limit here. You should set a limit there, but you forget, or it doesn't feel comfortable when you get to do it or whatever. And the difference between it's the difference between having head knowledge or being able to feel it in your body and your mm -hmm. kid is doing that. And you're like, that is a no, that is yeah. a hard no, yes. right? Because yeah. you yeah. can totally feel it. So yeah. anyways, I guess no, I just want to so true. And say, that's, I think that's a really common, you know, from working with like hundreds of clients over the years, I think that yeah. boundary work is like number one thing that I see with people where, where either we overdo the no and really like yeah. more of a shutdown or we just more commonly actually we underdo it. We don't yeah, you know where it is or where our boundary is. And so to, to start to establish that. And I think what a beautiful thing to be able to have a group of people to kind of work with that with who yeah. are all kind of on the same journey of trying to raise these little beings into being like half decent humans in the world. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, what yeah. A great opportunity. So yeah. Thank you for offering that. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And yeah, thank you for, for being with us today. It's great to hear a little bit more about your work and yeah, what a blessing for the people who get to, to come into your fold and learn through your literal embodied download of what your parenting journey has been. And then all the other parents that you've worked with that, that can get transmitted to benefit these kids that are out there trying to grow up at this time. It's a crazy time to be a kid in the world. So. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation, Josia. It was great to see you. I appreciate what you're putting out in the world. Mm -hmm. 
This has been another episode of Through the Dark Woods podcast. I'm your host, Josia Tamira Crossley. If you feel up for it, I'd deeply appreciate you rating and reviewing this podcast on Spotify or your preferred listening platform. You can also join my email list to stay tuned to upcoming offerings and events, as well as receive occasional missives and musings from my pen to your inbox. May this work benefit all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free, free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May we all recognize liberation together. Wishing you a harmonious day filled with connection to yourself, your people, and the natural world.